to sacrifice in order to help somebody get good education is wonderful. To sacrifice in order that somebody may uh, have a better shot at life is great. To sacrifice so that someone will have the necessities of life, it's terrific. But to sacrifice so that someone become eternally saved and have a different destination eternally from where they're going now is the greatest sacrifice of all. This is not my idea, it's Jesus' idea. This is not the Church of the Apostles' idea, this is God's idea. And I want you to turn with me, please, to Mark chapter 2, 1 to 12. I try to imagine this scenario and try to uh, just put my arms around it. And, 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 you know, if you grew up in a culture like I did with masses of people, you will have a glimpse of what that means. If you have never been in a mob scene, you might not be able to put your arm around this. If, if you've never been caught in the middle of a, a, a mass of humanity and, and, and bodies everywhere, uh, you will not get your arms around this, but I'll try to make it uh, as easy as possible for you because I know when I was a boy one time, I got caught in one of those masses of people and almost was trampled underfoot. The situation in Capernaum was wall to wall with people. There were not even enough room for one body to go through the crowd. Uh, not even outside the house, let alone inside the house. But then there were four friends who not only needed to cram their bodies within those masses of people, they needed to take a stretcher with them where they're carrying their friend into the house. Their friend obviously is a quadriplegic because he was on a stretcher. Normally a paraplegic would be carried by two people face to face and even in places where there are no wheelchairs, they still do that for paraplegics. The scene was so discouraging, to say the least, to all those four friends. Uh, no one would budge and make room for them. Uh, they all came for Jesus to meet their needs, and they're not about to leave their space and, 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 and sacrifice their place. This was a wall of humanity that is imperitable. A wall of humanity was immovable. That wall of humanity was rock solid. But these four friends made the decision to move out. They were going to move out of their comfort zone in order to bring their friend to the feet of Jesus, and nothing was going to stop them. Uh, theirs was not a half-hearted commitment. Their commitment was binding. Their commitment was unwavering. Their, their commitment was immovable. Their dedication was not fleeting and was not momentarily. It was not just for a period of time. It was day in and day out, week in and week out. And if anybody needed or can have a, a good excuse to give up and just say, well, we gave it our best, this, those four have every excuse in the book. They could have said, well, man, we gave it the old college try, and it did not work. Uh, we did our best, but we failed. We, did, we went the distance, but it's not working. Uh, we might try another time. Uh, we have taken so much time of our busy schedule, and we cannot take any more time out of work. We did all that we could, and it's impossible. We couldn't do it. Oh, then there is the old, big, uh, pious uh, excuse. It might not be the will of God. Ah, it's not God's timing. Maybe just it's the wrong time and the wrong place. Beloved, let me tell you something, and I'm confessing to you. I have given up at times for lesser obstacles. I know I have given up on some things too early, too soon. I know that I have prayed for things that I knew was consistent with the will of God, consistent with the Word of God, that were consistent with the character of God, that were consistent with my knowledge of God, and yet when my prayers were not answered quickly, I gave up praying. And when God later on answered my prayer, I sat in a puddle of tears out of shame and embarrassment before God, not people, but before God that I gave up too soon. I tried to lead someone to Christ, and 
When that person would not come to Christ, I gave up praying for that person. Long time later, that person came to Christ. Meanwhile, I came across the biography of George Mueller, and that man's life has become a rebuke for me. He was a man of faith. He trusted God. He prayed for supernatural miracles, and they happened quickly and fast, but they're not all that way. He had prayed for some people to come to Christ for 23 years. I couldn't persist for 23 days. So I began to learn persistence in prayer from George Mueller. I began to learn to persist in effort. I began to learn to persist in the face of unbendable obstacles. If you look at the passage in the Scripture, the Bible doesn't give us a great deal of information about them. We don't have a great, a lot of knowledge about who they are. We don't know their names. We, we don't know their professions. We don't know where they came from. We don't know uh, what uh, family background they had. They, we don't know the level of their education. We, we, we don't know what their biblical knowledge was like. Ah, oh, but we know two things, and they all come from the, what we see here in the text. First, they had undaunted faith in Jesus. And secondly, they had an irrepressible commitment to their friend's deliverance. They had an undaunted faith in Jesus. They knew that only Jesus could save their friend. They knew that only Jesus can answer their dilemma. Probably they've tried other avenues and other things and other ways and other people, and nothing worked. And these four people knew that only Jesus could meet their friend's desperate need. Only Jesus could give their friend what no one else could give him. Only Jesus could heal the body and heal the soul. Only Jesus could perform the real miracle that he, they needed. Only Jesus could touch the physical and the spiritual infirmities and make him whole. Only Jesus could give him the peace of mind that he was searching for. And that is why they persisted. And that is why they would not allow difficulties to stop them. They would not allow crowd to hinder them. They would not allow perplexity of the situation to deter them. They would not allow anything, anything to come in their way, and not even the personal sacrifice. Not long ago, I read the story about a ship that was sank, and many passengers on that ship have drowned. Among those who perished in that ill-fated vessel were 129 Salvation Army officers. When their bodies were recovered later, not one of them had a life vest on him. Survivors told of how these faithful servants of God reacted with calm and with confidence when passengers were informed of the ship's inevitable fate. You see, there were not enough live vests on board. So they confidently removed theirs and gave them to others. And they were heard to have said, we know the Savior, and we are ready to meet the Lord, but others were not. And they went down singing praises to the Lord. No wonder General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army motto, which was one word, others. That word took a new meaning and a new significance as the message of the death of those 129 Salvation Army officers echoed around the world. They had undaunted faith in Jesus. These four friends climbed the roof of the house. They dug a hole in the roof, and they lowered the, their friend all, all the way down in front of Jesus. The issue here is their persistence in faith. Look at verse 5, and if you have your Bible with you and have a pen, I want you to underline that. Verse 5 says, seeing their faith, Jesus. Seeing their faith. Jesus. Seeing their face, Jesus said 
Son, your sins are forgiven. We don't know much about the faith of the, of the man who is paralyzed. We, we don't know much about it. He could have had the greatest faith of all. We don't know. Jesus did not refer to his faith. He referred to their faith. Seeing their faith. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Don't miss it. For when you try to introduce someone to Jesus, when you try to bring someone to the feet of Jesus, they may not know much about the Bible. They may not know much about faith. They may not be able to articulate their desperate need for forgiveness and release from guilt and the, that burning in their minds. They may not be able to comprehend how, why, and only Jesus can forgive sins, but that doesn't matter. God is seeing your faith. God is seeing your commitment. God is seeing your desire to see the person saved. God honors your desire for their forgiveness. And God responds to you by taking steps to honor your faith. They had an undaunted faith in Jesus. Secondly, they had an irrepressible commitment to save their friend. I think most of us would say we have, if you know the Lord, an irrepressible desire to see family members saved, a spouse saved, a dear friend saved, a co-worker saved. And that's where you start. That's where you begin. That's where you need to start. But if you are like me, now your family saved, and your co-worker saved, you sit in your blessed assurance that, well, I'm saved, my family saved, my co-worker saved, so I don't need to do anything. No, that is not at all consistent with those who belong to Christ. Your faith in Jesus, then, must be exercised on behalf of whomever the Lord brings you away. These four people did not just want their friend to be healed. They wanted him to be eternally saved. And that is why Jesus said to the man, your sins are forgiven. These friends knew that Jesus is the only one who can forgive sins. Sadly, today there are so many church-going people who don't know who Jesus is. They think they do, but they don't. They live their life as if they don't. There are so many people who are preaching Jesus in church pulpits, but they don't know who Jesus is. They think they do, but they're preaching the wrong Jesus. Uh, our God has fully revealed Himself in Jesus. Theirs is not. Uh, our God allows us to know Him personally. Theirs does not. Our God is a knowable God. Theirs is not. Our God reveals Himself to us in His Word, but theirs does not. Our God indwells us by His Holy Spirit, but theirs does not. I believe in knowledge. I think knowledge is very important. I know there's some, you know, time in the past where Christians kind of always attacked knowledge and studies and, and so forth. I am not. <laughs> knowledge is wonderful. Because knowledge will always, if a person is sincere, it will lead to the truth. In fact, knowledge of God for us, the Christian believers, is the ladder upon which faith climbs. Uh, knowledge of God is the springboard uh, from which faith can leap forward and onward. 